Thank you, Kerry. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you, ACI. I was a little worried that there wasn't going to be a code for me, but uh, uh, thank you for setting that up. Um, I have a daunting task here to uh, provide you with some questions, some provoking questions, so we can have a discussion in the last 20 or 30 minutes of this session. Um, I'd like to start by reminding you of something that Bernie said. The ACI code is not only used in the Americas. It's used and followed throughout the world. 70 countries, you said, Bernie. Keep that in mind. The decisions that are made in these meetings affect millions. And when we talk about earthquake resistant systems, we should not think only about LA and San Francisco and Seattle. Uh, and in that sense, or because of that, I'm going to try to compare what we saw in Turkey with what we've seen in other places. Uh, and before I forget, if you're interested in the data we've collected, the data are available to everyone, please contact ACI Committee 133 and we'll share everything with you. The list of people who participated in this, as you can tell from this slide, is too long for us to mention everyone, uh, but I do want to emphasize again that ACI was extremely helpful in setting everything up and funding this mission. Remy and Chongwok discussed eloquently issues about detailing and issues about the configuration of these buildings. I'm going to try to put things in perspective using some uh, numbers, if you will, quantifying things a little bit more to try to address this question. Why did this happen? And there are at least three key factors here. The intensity of the motion was, let's say, just scary. And Remy illustrated how in many places what occurred was similar to what we call the design basis event or what the seismologist told was a design basis event, but there were instances in which what was recorded exceeded the maximum considered event. And this is not the first time we, we see something this bad. Where I work now, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in New Zealand, we had something similar in Christchurch. We had, in uh, 2011, we had motions that exceeded the maximum that could possibly happen. And those kinds of things are supposed to occur only every so many thousands of years. Either we're very unlucky, or we need to rethink how much confidence we place in the estimates we, we get from seismologists with all due respect. I mean, they do a great job, but uh, something, something may be amiss. That's the first factor, the intensity of the motion. We have to acknowledge this was a very demanding event or series of events. But Chongwok made the case that these buildings were rather flimsy. They lacked robustness. And that attracted too much drift. The buildings swayed too much. And when a building sways too much, things deform too much. And that revealed all sorts of problems with the detailing. And I think you've seen enough of that. And the press stressed that a lot. The press said this mess happened because the contractors cheated. Uh, well, they may have missed 
uh, a couple of cross ties here or there, or they may have misplaced a few ties. But I tell you, they did not remove columns that appeared in the drawings to save that concrete. Uh, they did not change the dimensions of the shear walls, as far as we could tell from the few drawings we obtained. No one cheats by removing a shear wall out of a building. No, no one is that dumb. Uh, and it's not that the building code in Turkey is utterly inadequate. Huh? It's uh, similar to our building code. And that's what should make us ponder. So to address the first issue, the intensity, let me show you a couple of, of plots related to intensity. The most common intensity measure that we use is peak ground acceleration. That's what you see in the x-axis here. In the y-axis, you see percent of buildings that were classified as having severe or critical damage by two groups, our group and a large group that was convened by the Turkish government to survey large areas. They surveyed thousands of buildings. And what we were trying to see is whether there was correlation with the frequency of damage, if you will, with different intensity measures. You don't see a great correlation there, do you? And in fact, uh, some of these R square values are negative, meaning you might as well just draw a straight line here and you get as good a correlation. Uh, that's the first observation that I want you to get out of this slide. The second observation I want you to get out of this slide is that the values of peak ground acceleration that were measured were quite high, scary again. Now, when I went to school, I was told, you know, for a place like California, you design for half a G or so. Look at that. We went to almost three times that. And it's not the first time this happens. They've measured up to 3G in Japan. And look at the consequences. In some cities, each point here represents a city. In some cities, half the inventory was severely damaged. Or according to our observations, half of the inventory had critical damage. How did we, in ACI 133, define critical damage? Damage that made us very uncomfortable to be in the building. Damage to the degree that we thought if we, if we had an aftershock while we were in the building, we wouldn't make it back home. Uh, so that's, that's the degree of damage that occurred. Now, PGA clearly is not the best intensity measure there is. So we tried other intensity measures. And to make my story a little shorter, this is what we saw when we used peak ground velocity as an intensity measure instead of peak ground acceleration. Better correlation. And that's what I want you to get out of this slide. I also want you to, again, observe the range of values that were measured from half a meter per second to almost two meters per second. By the way, the half G PGA that one uses in California corresponds to roughly half a meter per second. So again, this is what at least I was taught in the school one designs for. We measured things that were, again, up to three times larger. Very intense motions. Uh, the number of motions with velocities exceeding one meter per second, mm, I think doubled what we had in the in the historic record. Quite a demanding motion. Now, that's intensity. Mm, and it's not news that PGV is a good measure of intensity. That was already said. That was said in the 1930s, believe it or not, by Westergaard at the University of Illinois. And then later, that was re-emphasized by Professor Mette Sozend 
who has been mentioned a few times here, uh, who said that, and this is hard to believe, but the displacement of the roof of the structure is roughly proportional to the peak ground velocity and the initial period of the structure. It's hard to believe things could be this simple. It, it looks like high school physics, huh? Displacement is velocity times some measure of time. Uh, this implies, that, as I was saying, that, of course, the intensity measures, the intensity drives displacement, and displacement is what drives damage. But the robustness of the building, the stiffness of the building, also determines or uh, influences how much damage occurs. And according to Mede, it's the period of the building what captures the best, the robustness of the structure. Now, you would say that this rough approximation cannot possibly lead to good results in terms of uh, measures of displacement of measures of damage. Well, it does. Let me illustrate that with this slide here where on the x-axis, I'm showing um, drift ratios estimated in percentage from that expression, multiplying PGV times T to obtain roof displacement, and the first mode shape to translate that into um, story drift. That's what's in the x-axis. And in the y-axis, you have measured story drift ratios, values measured in tests in the lab. Pretty good correlation, despite the obvious approximations related to this. Now you could say, ah, we can do better. We have sophisticated nonlinear dynamic analysis software. It must do better. It doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, but what I really want you to uh, remember here is that what drove the damage as Remy and Chungwook were saying, were the large deformations that occurred, the drift that occurred, and that, according to what I'm presenting here, is related to the peak ground velocity and the period of the building. Mm. To show you yet in another way the power of that concept, that is the velocity and the period what drives the damage. Uh, I have another plot here in which instead of you, um, showing you um, results from measurements, I'm showing you results from calculations by Liam Pledger, who has run hundreds of nonlinear analyses. And what he's done is he's tried to find out what value of intensity is required to reach drifts like the ones we saw in that building, uh, high drifts of, in this case, 4% which can cause instability. When you have that level of deformation, P delta brings your building down. And what he's noticed is that the level of intensity required to essentially cause um, instability in the building is essentially a linear function of the um, period of the structure, as the expression by Sosen suggested. The x-axis here, you can think of it as the denominator that one uses to estimate period. Everyone here, I'm sure, has heard of the expression n over 10, number of stories over 10 to estimate period. So that would be this 10. And what this slide suggests then is that if you design for a period of n over 10, a ground motion with a peak ground velocity somewhere between one and, an, and one and a half seconds will cause a lot of drift in your building. Well, remember, in Turkey they measured much more than one meter per second, which will require you to have periods of the order of something closer to N over 20 to do well in the earthquake. N over 20, not N over 10 were off by a factor of two in terms of period. That's a factor of four in terms of stiffness. Now you would argue, who's going to do that? That's too much. Well, that's done. It's done all the time in Japan. 
and in Chile, but in not too many other places. Colombia, believe it or not, and not because I'm from Colombia, but believe it or not, uh, Colombia does something similar because Luis Garcia, who we miss terribly at these meetings, lowered the drift limits in Colombia in 2010. But this is where most other countries operate. And it, remember, it's not just California that we need to keep in mind. We, keep, we need to keep in mind everyone else who imitates what ACI does. Uh, this is where the rest of the world operates at n over 10, which will lead to, for 10 stories, a period of one seconds, or sometimes even longer periods. In New Zealand, where I live, especially in the Canterbury region, it's not uncommon to find periods of n over 5. Uh, but measuring period in the field is not easy. So Chum Wook already mentioned a proxy to estimate the robustness, if you will, the stiffness of a structure. And that comes in the shape of these indices that were proposed by Hassan and Sozin, that we call the wall index and the uh, column index. And I'm going to use those to compare the structures that we saw in Turkey with structures that we saw elsewhere. So just to remind you, or if you just arrived, the wall index is the summation of the cross-sectional areas of walls watch it, in one direction at a time. And of course, we examine first the more critical direction, which will be the direction with the least amount of wall. Uh, as Chung Wook mentioned, if there is infill confined by masonry, and I think Javid asked this question, if there is infill well confined by masonry and without windows, it stiffens the structure a lot. The stiffness can I've seen stiffnesses that go up by a factor of five because of infill, yeah. Uh, so we take that into account. We add it at a discounted rate, as Chung Wook explained, taking only one-tenth of the full area, and we add that to the numerator. That's the numerator here. And the denominator is the floor area of all the levels above the ground level. All of them, not one. That's the wall index. And the column index is similar, except that in the numerator we have column areas, and except that we have this denominator of two there. You can think of that as a way to say, ah, oh, the column has to work in two directions. The wall works mostly in one direction, the column doesn't, so we divide by two. At least that's one way to think about it. So I'm going to use these two indices to put in perspective what we saw in Turkey, to judge how good or how bad these buildings were compared with buildings that we've observed or investigated elsewhere. I'm going to start referring to Chile, where Sharon Wood, uh, I think Jim White, uh, Jack Maley, uh, Professor De La Calle, a, a number of people whom you know well, uh, after the 1985 Viña del Mar earthquake, surveyed a whole bunch of buildings in beautiful detail. And I highly recommend the reports they wrote, which were published at the University of Illinois. Mm, and thanks to that, we, uh, at least uh, Mr. Pleasure, working with me at Canterbury, we've been able to calculate column indices and wall indices for, for those buildings. And this is what we've seen. The Chileans love the uh, reinforced concrete wall. They put a lot of it. And they put so much of it that they don't need columns. <laughs> That's a Chilean building. It's full of wall, and as you know, that building tends to do very well. Now, to put things in perspective, let me compare that with what the Japanese do. And in my mind, these, these are always the reference points. Japan and Chile, because they do very well in very intense earthquakes with frequency, very often. So this is what Japan looks like in this domain, so to speak. Look at that. Chile, Japan. Lots of wall, 
And somehow, they also add color. <laughs> the Japanese system is the dual system. There's always frame, there's always wall, no matter the height. And that results in very robust structures. These red points, by the way, are buildings. They refer to buildings. Each point refers to a building, and the red ones refer to buildings with damage. In this case, uh, mostly shear failures in columns. And what you start to notice is that the buildings with less abundant wall do a little bit worse. You have more red points here than you have here. That's Japan. Let's go a little bit further south in the far east, so to speak. Here's Taiwan, which ACI Committee 133 visited in 2016, if I remember correctly. The Taiwanese, whom I admire very much, they do great research, uh, but I'm afraid they don't put as much emphasis on the amount of wall in the building, and you start seeing again more reds appearing, more point, red points appearing near this origin. And then, to contrast this, I'm going to show again the plot that Chomuk showed uh, with the data we just collected in Turkey. Ready? Here it is. Yeah. And I think this tells the story. Yes, the detailing was not great. Yes, they did cheat in that they didn't put all the cross ties that we saw in the drawings. Uh, they did goof in that they bent the bars at the bottom of the uh, walls and columns to m line up the reinforcement. They did make mistakes in that there wasn't good spacing between bars. All that is true. And every now and then, the concrete quality didn't seem the greatest. But I think the bigger story here, behind all of that, is this. These buildings were too flimsy in terms of the amount of wall and amount of column that they had. Or if you want to put it back in the terms in which I started the presentation, the periods of these buildings were too long, n over seven or so. That is not right in my mind. Uh, but you would argue, well, this is just one event. How about other places? Well, by now, again, thanks to the efforts of ACI 133, thanks to some funding from the National Science Foundation, and the work of many others, including, again, uh, Sharon Wood and her colleagues, the work of Professor Shiga, Shibata, and uh, Takahashi in 1968, we've been able to collect um, this type of information for 15 events. So let me explain what this shows. The x-axis here is now the summation of column index and wall index. Okay? We're adding those two up. The x-axis is percent of buildings classified as having severe damage. And do keep in mind, we're talking about data collected since 1968, so different people with different opinions have classified these buildings. But by and large, severe damage means there is a failure somewhere in the building. Uh, now, each point here doesn't represent a single building. Each point represents a city or a region that was surveyed. And these are therefore averages, averages of priority indices, which is again the summation of column index and wall index. And this is the average number of buildings classified as having severe damage in percent. This is where Turkey 2023 lies. I'm sorry to say, because I live there now, this is where Christchurch, New Zealand lies after the 2011 Canterbury earthquakes. This is where Chile is. And this is Japan. Someone was asking me, are the Turkish engineers building better buildings that they built in 1999, when, if you remember, the Koja Elian Duzje earthquakes happened? Well, not really. Here's Duzje, 1999. Here's Turkey, 
2023, the average summation of column index and wall index is almost the same. And the code has changed in Turkey since, but the buildings are not more robust. Now, something that should be obvious is that the intensities of all these motions were not the same. So you could argue we should normalize the x-axis relative to intensity. So we've tried to do that by dividing by PGV here. And that's why I started the presentation mentioning different measures of intensity. So if you do that, the data line up a little bit better. But th this point here only moves to the left because the intensity of the motion in Turkey was so high in 2023. My question is, where is San Francisco, where is LA, where is Seattle going to end up in this plot? And God, I hope I don't have to see that. Touch wood, they say in, in New Zealand. They don't say knock on wood, they say touch wood. So. Uh, where, where are we going to end up in this plot? And remember, it's not just us. It's everyone else who mimics what ACI does. Where is Jakarta going to end up? Where is Kathmandu going to end up in the next event? God forbid there's a, another one. Mm. Here's the same data, but instead of averages, we plotted all the dots we got Every building we've inspected, there are 1,600 or so buildings here, and everything is plotted again versus column index and wall index. The red points, once more, represent buildings in trouble. And I think it's fairly safe to say the closer you are to the origin, the more likely you are to end up in trouble. There are white squares underneath those red dots, which you don't see. That's not uncommon. There are crummy buildings that survive earthquakes, and sometimes we don't understand why. Uh, but we don't have to. The truth is that the frequency of damage in this region is at least two-thirds. If you live here near the origin, the probability of severe damage is uh, at least 60, 70%. It's too high. Thank God, things are starting to, uh, or, or this is starting to be reflected by codified material. These guidelines published by FEMA a few years ago will tell you, if you have a wall index exceeding 0.2%, your building, by and large, it's good, and you don't have to do much analysis to evaluate it. And I'm very grateful that has happened. This guide from ACI itself says, never mind the old buildings, your new buildings should also have a minimum wall index of 0.2%. That was done, again, thanks to Luis Garcia. And the good news is that our Turkish colleagues who helped us in this event are telling us that the Turkish Building Code Committee has agreed to draw a line and require new buildings again, even if they have good detailing, to have a wall index exceeding a quarter of a percent. And this is not official yet, because I understand this has to go through some ministry or something in Turkey. I promise you, if this passes, I'm going to go back to Turkey and I'm going to swim across the Bosphorus to celebrate because I am convinced this is going to save thousands of lives. Uh, the essence of it is you need to draw a line here, and you can draw many lines here. You can draw an inclined line. You can draw a circle if you want. Uh, the, but the catch is you need to be far away from the origin. And one simple way to do that, and seemingly very effective way to do that is to put wall in your building and require buildings to be above a line like this, say at 0.2 percent. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. And I know, I know, that's not what is taking the, you know, most of the ink in our journals. 
everyone is writing about incremental dynamic analysis, performance-based design, uh, sophisticated things. But damn it, when you go that route, inspection, control in the field is not easy. When you go this route, all you gotta do is make sure you see the wall, right? And measure a few and check areas and you're done. Interestingly, Chumwok mentioned we, we looked at buildings up to 15 stories tall. So this should apply up to that level. From there on, if you multiply 0.2% times 15, you get 3%. That would be the area um, of one floor occupied by wall, 3%. That's what they use in Chile. And again, it, the Chilean buildings do very well. So from 15 stories on, at least the evidence we have will suggest all you need to do is follow the Chilean formula. You don't need to keep increasing the numbers of, of walls or the amount of wall with increasing number of stories. So follow this or use the Chilean formula for taller buildings. Uh, that should help us cope with the types of intensities that are being observed. And that should help us deal with this lack of robustness, which is what triggers all the failures when our detailing is not good. But I thought I could stop here, and, and I will if you're tired. Just raise one hand up and I'll stop. But I thought I would sort of ask myself some of the questions that I've been hearing, because thanks to Bernie, I presented this uh, through the ACI Ambassador progr Program, and I presented at uh, a couple of other venues. So I thought I would sort of preempt some of the questions uh, as to why can we not do something like that, whether through ACI or with help from um, ASCE. Why cannot we limit the period or require a minimum amount of wall for highly seismic areas? Or why cannot we just lower the drift limits? All those three actions, if you will, will have the same result. Increase the robustness of our buildings. Why can we not that? And what I hear is that, oh, well, we know better. We do better detailing. We don't skip the ties like you showed there. Huh, how dare you suggest that? Uh, we know better. Well, do we? As Chomwook mentioned, these buildings were worth which were supposed to be designed with the same set of drawings by the same contractor and all. They had not great, but okay detailing. Didn't work. Because if the building is too flimsy, it drifts too much. And if it drifts too much, if you reach 6% there, and I don't know how you measure that, but it must have not been safe, whatever you did. Uh, if you reach 6%, you don't want to be in that building because P delta causes instability. And this shows that, yes, the splices worked in this building. Yes, there was fracture of bars. The spacing of the ties wasn't too bad. And there were even cross ties, which were nowhere to be found in most other buildings. Still, you can have the best detailing in the world. That's not going to control drift. Is robustness what controls drift. Here's another one. You could argue, well, we don't do this poor detailing in the lap supplies. In fact, we now ban it, now. So we know better. Well, that's what I was told in New Zealand also when I showed pictures like this. And they said, we know better, they don't ban the lap splice at the base of the wall, but they stagger the lap splice. You know, they put one splice here, the next one a little bit higher up, and so on. They say, that's better. Well, we tested the staggered lap splice at the end of the wall. Still failed. At one and a half percent drift. And this meets the Kiwi code, which, God, has every provision you could ever imagine. It's all there, it's, a, it's this thick. And, and you, if you think the ACI code is complicated, go look at the Kiwi code. 
You, you know how the code always says, go to, you know, section this and that, and section this and that. Well, it's that to the nth power <laughs> in New Zealand. Uh, another argument is that, no, no, this is the land of the free. Let the architect do their job, and then we'll, we'll figure out what to do. We need open spaces. Uh, you know, we put everything in the court. The rest has to be open. We need windows. Damn it, the Chileans like windows, too. This is a <laughs> building in Viña del Mar. Every apartment has a sea view, an ocean view. How nice. And this thing has seen two big, big earthquakes. And I went in there, they, they wouldn't let me in any apartment because they're being used, they're untouched. Here's another example also from Viña del Mar, and I think Andres, you took this picture. Lots of windows. You can do it. These are buildings with 3% of their wall area, so of their floor area, occupied by wall. Uh, and then the last sort of preemptive question is, wait a minute, this is going to cost too much. Well, Mr. Pledger here, working with me at Canterbury again, has taken the time to design a bunch of frames to drift limits going from our 2.5% down to half a percent. And this is what he has calculated is the increase in overall cost, overall cost, including everything, even the cost of the land. And land is expensive in Wellington, where we pretended we were doing this. But still, I remember Luis Garcia coming up with similar numbers, working with uh, John Bonacci. If you design for a drift limit of 1%, the increase in cost, believe it or not, is about 1% too. And think about this, the realtor gets 6%. Hmm? And not once, many times, as many as your apartment is sold. Uh, so, I'd like to open the floor for a discussion with this question. Why can't we do something to increase the robustness of our structures? If we keep designing for a drift limit of 2.5%, we'll keep producing buildings with periods on the order of n over 10. And I think the field evidence says that doesn't cut it. And Bernie, I'd like to end here with, with this slide uh, while people um, formulate their questions, because I, this really sort of moved me. This picture comes from an archaeological site in this region of Turkey, where I read they've found the first instances of things that look like concrete. This was concrete made with lime. But what really moved me is that apparently these ruins are 12,000 years old. This thing was built before agriculture existed, so they say. We've been building with concrete for a long time. And I think it's a shame that right next door we have entire cities being evacuated if nothing else, because the damn partitions collapsed. That needs to stop, and I think it stops by addressing this question. So, please. Any comments, questions? Thanks for the presentation. I have a few quick questions. Some of them are probably silly. Sorry for that. First question is, is it just reducing the period limit, putting a limit, more stringent limit on the period, stiffening the structure? Is it related to that, or is it more related to more uh, building behavior, global behavior, higher mod effects, over strength factor, all that coming into play? Again, in the global behavior, lack of detailing, lack of load path, lack of engineering. Other question, again, um, I don't mean to be mean, but this is just to learn. Um, you said you observed uh, uh, the standing buildings, not the collapsed ones. When you say, uh, when you discuss, is it the lack of detailing again or something else? Um, 
can you explain, can you, can you give your insights w why you are generalizing without observing the collapsed, I mean, I don't even know how that could be done, collapsed buildings? And lastly, did you observe, did you investigate any near fault effects on the structures? As far as I know, there were significant near fault effects on the structures. So every time someone says my question is uh, silly or naive, that means the question is hard. <laughs> and uh, let, let me try my best. Uh, let me start with the first question. Is it really just the period? Uh, well, in my mind, the period is the main driver, of course. You see, the response of a building to an earthquake is the result of almost a chaotic, chaotic interaction of many factors. You know, whether the building is next to the fault, what type of soils occur underneath, the shape of the resulting spectrum, whether there is torsion or not, whether there are higher mode effects, the works. But by and large, the number one driving parameter is the stiffness. It's not the strength, and I have a couple of slides that mention that too. You, you can have more or less strength by and large, especially for uh, what Newmark called the uh, nearly constant velocity region of the spectrum is the period what drives the damage. It's the stiffness, because drift is driven by stiffness. Um, the second question, if I understood correctly, is how can we infer much about collapsed buildings? Because we didn't inspect them, we couldn't. We did find drawings, thanks to the help of local authorities, for some of the collapsed buildings. So we've included those here. We didn't have access to the structure. Well, there was no structure, but a pile of rubble. But we did get some drawings from collapsed buildings. And uh, the third question is about near fault effects. Well, as Chungwook and Remy illustrated, the cities we surveyed are all lined up. They form a perfect line, almost. The reason is that they were all built right on the damn fault. Why? Because, well, faults have this nasty habit of, of creating valleys, and valleys are nice and flat, so you build there both buildings and roads. So <laughs> I would say the great majority of the buildings we surveyed were near the fault, were right on top of the fault. But it is true that as you drove south towards Antakya, the damage was worse, the intensity was worse. And that seems to have something to do with the way that waves travel from the rupture towards the building, kind of like the Doppler effect. Hmm? Uh, so that may have to do with the concentration of damage in Antakya. We did separate our data in two groups. The, c the cities cl closer to Antakya, where the intensity was higher, and the cities further north. And, and yes, you do see that the buildings up north tended to do better. The intensities were a little lower. So that does happen. And of course, if you go far enough, if you go to Siberia, then there's no damage and you don't need any wall, right? Any other questions? Santiago, I cannot thank you and your team enough for the wonderful work that you have been doing. Uh, this is great, and, and thank you. Uh, so coming back to your question here, that a lot of times the counter argument that I hear is that if you make your building stiffer, it will attract more base shear. You know, always engineers say you know you need to find the fine line between stiffness and um, drift and, and design for that. So if you make your building, you know, stiff that, you know, that the maximum interstory drift is 1%, then you're going to make it really stiff, attracts a lot of base shear. You have to, you know, ramp up, ramp up your, your strength and, you know, all of your links and th all of that. So um, we do design here buildings to that would, you know, the way we detail them to at least be able to sustain several cycles at drifts that are like in the order of 2% maybe or so, in the columns maybe 3% or so. So uh, 
I, I, I just would like to hear your thoughts on, on this. And that my other question is that what I have seen the damage is that primarily related to the uh, axial load carrying capacity elements or the lateral load resisting systems. That I, wanna, I would like to see if you've seen any damage related to uh, the horizontal lateral flow resisting system, diaphragms or foundations. Uh, was there any, any observations related to these two? Thank you. So the first question is, uh, what about strength and whether one gets in trouble with forces by making the building stiffer because you will be operating in the region of the spectrum where accelerations are higher? Um, let me try to answer in two ways. First answer I would give um, would be sort of an attempt to uh, paraphrase Meta Sozin, who said something along the lines of, it's not the earthquake that determines the forces that occur in the building, it's the engineer who determines the forces that occur in the building because it is up to you to select the longitudinal reinforcement. You can make the building experience smaller or larger forces depending on how much longitudinal reinforcement you put in, in the building. You know that very well, right? If you test a wall and it's well detailed, it'll yield in flexure. You can lower that the force that yield if you put less longitudinal reinforcement. So you can control the forces occurring in, in the building and we're shooting ourselves in the foot by using linear analyses um, to estimate those forces. Let's take the case of a coupling beam. When you do linear analysis, the coupling beam is so stiff that you end up concluding it needs a lot of it, it will attract a lot of moment and therefore it needs a lot of longitudinal reinforcement. If you lower that amount of longitudinal reinforcement, nothing happens. And, and Sozin tested coupling uh, beams in dual, no, in coupled wall systems with uh, Jose Dario Aristizabal. They tested uh, coupled systems designed using linear analysis forces and then they tested other systems with four times less reinforcement in the coupling beams, they worked the same. Um, in reinforced concrete, we have the luxury of controlling stiffness and strength, not quite in completely independent fashion, but in somewhat independent fashion, right? We have control over the amount of longitudinal reinforcement. And very often, we make the mistake of being uh, generous with the longitudinal bars and stingy with the transverse bars. We should do the opposite. The other thing I would uh, say, Saman, is, I, I was ready for your question. Uh, we didn't rehearse this. Uh, <coughs> this curve here shows the inverse of what we call the R factor. obtained for buildings designed for drift, buildings designed to drift 1%, buildings of different heights, if you will. And what you see, Saman, here is that the R factor that you would result, that you would obtain, uh, among other things, because uh, we have minimum reinforcement, right? So even if you have a lot of wall and column, you end up with a lot of strength because things have to have at least minimum reinforcement. The R factor associated or resulting from designing for drift first. It's huge. You see, these, uh, the, the smallest value here is about a third, implying an R factor of three. That's pretty, pretty good. If you design for drift, strength comes along, sort of a, as a secondary result. Joanne Browning, whom most of you probably have heard of, wrote her thesis about this. She said it in 1998. I was very young back then. Uh, you design for drift, strength comes along. It's not a problem. Ah, yeah. I was wondering, was there a second question? I'm not used to this. <laughs> 
multi-question question. question. Um, damage to foundations and diaphragms. None, almost, to, that we thought we needed to pay special attention to in the areas we surveyed. Now, there was a town right next to a lake. The name in Turkish I could not memorize. The only thing I remember is that the name means the town next to the lake. <laughs> that, <laughs> all the foundations were trashed there because of liquefaction. Uh, but in Antakya, where most of this damage occurred, in Nurda, uh, in the places that we've been discussing here, yeah. Um, I guess I want to make a comment and see what your thoughts are, and, and also thank you for your presentation and bringing us back to the big picture fundamentals. Oftentimes we just get too into the details trying to prove how smart we can be and we overlook the fundamentals. Um, it seems like a trend of like, okay, we want to make sure we have a robust base design uh, on the configuration of the building to limit uh, drifts and also a lot of emphasis on how much non-structural causes damage and then ends up displacing people, which seems to be a trend of we're trying to come to the real, or we've come to the realization that our design philosophy of just limiting, you know, collapse, it's, it's no longer cutting it and we right. need to do more than that. And so I think both here in ACI or, and, or ERI, it's been a subject of discussion yes. that we need to do more. Uh, could you provide your thoughts on that and how we can navigate that. Going I would say you're absolutely right and and I would say there are at least two things that I would invite you to think about doing. One is as we move towards to use jargon a different performance objective right as we move from uh, life safety to immediate occupancy God and I hate jargon man this is the confuses us but as we try to produce better buildings that people can keep using, uh, we need to keep things simple. The route there is, or the best way to get there is not necessarily by running new and more complicated analyses. We don't have to do that. We don't have to create new chapters in our codes. Our codes are way too thick already. All we need to do is, again, control drift by either lowering the drift limit or mm, regulating, if you will, or, or trying to lower the period, or asking for a minimum amount of wall. It's, that's all it takes. And you can then run all the analysis you want, and if you have a special structure, maybe you do something different with some peer review. Keep things simple, though. For the majority of the structures, li limiting drift is all it takes. The second thing I would invite everyone to do is if you agree with this message, and if you know someone at ASCE, or whatever other entity there is, whether, again, not just in America, but uh, wherever you're from, talk to them. See if we can do something about this. I think it'll pay off. Look, in 1923, a guy by the name Howe, George Howe, an architect from Philly, was wondering how can we make better buildings. Uh, there had been a number of earthquakes in California, things were not doing well. He goes to or finds a way to interview this guy by the name Naito in Japan, Tanaka Naito. Naito tells him, it's easy man, put walls in the thing, in the building, it'll do better. He comes back from Japan, he goes to California, and in the 1930s, they had discovered the spectrum. So this guy comes back and says, make the uh, period shorter. Everyone in California says, no, 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 look at this thing we just discovered, the spectrum. You know, if you make the building shorter, the forces are going to be higher. By the way, the building is going to be more expensive too. The first code published in the U.S. for seismic design in 1953 or so, therefore did the exact opposite that the Japanese told how. The code encouraged, and it's fairly clear in the language, the code encouraged more flexible or 
more flimsy, I like to say. Flexibility sometimes is misunderstood for ability to deform or deformability. That's not the meaning. The, the, what we did in the 50s was to promote more flimsy buildings. And the entire uh, world copied that idea, except in Chile and Japan. And in my mind, that's why we're in this mess. Uh, I think it, it was in part our fault. Javi. I, I, I think uh, I'm thinking about the structural steel buildings versus concrete buildings, landscape. Uh, structural steel buildings versus uh, concrete buildings, uh, landscape, where the, the business is very competitive. Yes. So how do we justify a 2% increase in the cost of concrete buildings versus ah, steel buildings? Excellent question. You see, I think the steel folks have the same troubles that we do. Their buildings will also see a lot of drift after or during the earthquake. The partitions in those buildings are going to be in bad shape after the earthquake. The steel folks have the same challenges. And yes, they've improved their detailing too. Now they don't do the crummy welding and they tell us all oh, the welding is great and they, they have the reduced sections and so on. Their buildings are, this time are not going to fracture anywhere or things are not going to buckle. Well, we'll see. I don't think we've had... See, concrete has been unlucky in that it gets tested again and again <laughs> in all these places that see frequent earthquakes. I hope I'm wrong, but uh, Steve Mahan, who you must have heard of, told me once he was quite worried about steel buildings in San Francisco. I think we need to work hand in hand with AISC to make these changes happen. Because yes, if we charge 2% more, then those guys are going to get uh, you know, all the clients. And by the way, in Christchurch, which you know, is the land of the parks and the polis and all those guys with the P letter starting and uh, the last name, um, it was the land of concrete before the earthquake. You go now, 70% of the downtown area is steel. And not because the concrete buildings are more expensive. No, it's because the Kiwis are scared bottomless of concrete now, at least in Christchurch. So we're losing the battle, even if we don't do anything, man. We've got to do something. Yeah, and, and the questions are supposed to be directed to the entire panel, so I, I don't know why my, my friends here are being spared. This is unfair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the uh, presentation. Very informative, a nice Fresh, a breath of fresh air and a, a reminder of common sense. Um, my question is about a lot of your, your photos seem to be depicting high-rise um, buildings, and my question is more along the lines of maybe some, some shorter structures. Um, I guess, first of all, uh, was there a good mix of those that you um, studied? And second of all, I know, you know ordinary or intermediate special reinforced concrete moment frame structures do exist um, and at what point do you start to get nervous about those sorts of systems with no structural walls involved? At what, I guess, building height does that start to make you nervous in your experience? So we did have a good mix of different heights in our data. Uh, most of the buildings in the area had actually from four to eight stories. Um, we had to make an effort to get the higher buildings that you saw. And when we tried to separate the data into bins, you know, the shorter uh, buildings and the higher buildings, we saw similar trends. So I think the effects of height are being captured by these approximate indices well. I do want to emphasize the data are free to all of you. So if you want to dig into plausible ways to organize the data better, by all means, contact ACI 133 and we'll give you the data. And uh, what was the other question? Sorry. I guess the, the building heights, at what point, I know you have your recommendation ah, yeah. for wall index, but at what building height do you, do you start to get nervous about a moment frame system? No, I get nervous about moment frame systems that starting at a height of zero. Yeah. <laughs> uh, moment frame drifts too much. Uh, you really have to come up with fairly ridiculous dimensions for columns and beams before the drift it's low enough, and to me, low enough means 1% or less. Uh, I guess if you live 
in a region of infrequent earthquakes, you can live with the moment frame. The question is, what's infrequent? Christchurch was supposed to be one of those regions, and then boom. <laughs> if you don't mind. You know, you think that in Christchurch they will, they will be designing for the intensities that were measured? <coughs> no. They're measuring, they're designing for about half of what was measured. Because they're confident that it was a very unlikely event and it's not likely to occur again in a thousand years. God, I hope they got it right this time. 